إِنَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِّثْلِهِ وَادْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنتُمْ صَادِقِينَ فَإِن لَّمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَن تَفْعَلُوا فَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِن تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ كُلَّمَا رُزِقُوا مِنْهَا مِنْ ثَمَرَةٍ رِّزْقًا قَالُوا هَذَا الَّذِي رُزِقْنَا مِنْ قَبْلُ وَأُتُوا بِهِ مُتَشَابِهًا وَلَهُمْ فِيهَا أَزْوَاجٌ مُطَهَّرَةٌ وَهُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ رَبِّ اشْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَاحْلُلْ عُقْدَةً مِّن لِّسَانِي يَفْقَهُوا قَوْلِي فَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ وَالصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ ثُمَّ أَمَّا بَعْدُ وَنْس أَغَيْنْ إِيْفِي وَنْس أَسْلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ A couple of leftover items from previous ayat that were discussed, uh, those were up until ayah number 23. And then inshallah ta'ala we'll move forward today and finish up what we started with ayah number 23. The first of those things is about the ayah, Ya ayyuha nasu abudu rabbakum allathee khalaqakum wallatheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. Allah Azza wa Jalla says in that ayah that, you know, humanity, people, enslave yourselves to your master who created you and th- created those who came much before you so that you may protect yourselves. Uh, in that ayah, a couple of things about sequence. You'll notice that in the Qur'an, on several occasions, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions His relationship with us as, as Rabb first, and then alludes to the fact that He's our Creator. سَبِّحِ اسْمَ رَبِّكَ الْأَعْلَى الَّذِي خَلَقَ فَسَوَّى Right, so uh, that the fact that He's our Master is mentioned first, and the fact that He's our Creator is mentioned second. The same thing happens here. أُعْبُدُ رَبَّكُمْ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ Enslave yourselves to your Master, the one who created you. Now this is interesting because you know, you would think something, we are created first, and then as we mature, we accept that Allah is our master. So there's a chronological sequence, and that is that creation comes first, and then mastery over whatever you create. And yet, Allah Azza wa breaks that sequence. And this is part of the style, not only of the Qur'an, or of a powerful language. Human beings expect things generally to be in some kind of chronological or logical order. That's, that's the expectation of the mind. And creative language, and profound language is one that disrupts our normal expectations. Allah Azza wa breaks our expectation and mentions his rububiyah first, the fact that he's our master first, and then his relationship with us that he created us. But this is actually, like some have reflected, yutabiq al fitra al insaniya. This is actually in correspondence with human nature. How so? When a child is young, the only concern they have is who's going to take care of them. They run to their mother when food. The time comes, or when they're sleepy, or they're cranky, or when they're feeling cold, or when they're feeling scared. In other words, you turn to an authority in times of need, from childhood. And actually, most of our lives, especially our early lives, are built on relationships of dependency. And of course, the ultimate dependency, that relationship, is Rabb and Abd, right? So human beings naturally appreciate the relationships that are of dependency. But then, as they grow, and only few human beings get to that point, that when they get old enough, they start thinking about their, their reason for existing. Very few people in, uh, you know, on the earth that have lived this entire life that Allah has given us, ever stop and think, where did I come from? Why was I created? Who created me? Like these are, in a sense, a kind of philosophical question that most people don't ask. Most people ask, what's for lunch? Or when am I going to get a raise? Or when are we going to move out of an apartment and buy a house? Or when am I going to get a new car? Or these are the concerns, when am I going to get married? You know, or what are we going to name the baby? These are the things that are on people's minds. Things about their wants and their needs and how they're going to be taken care of. The fact is that the word Rabb includes in it every attribute you can think of that takes care of the human being. The word Rabb includes the meanings of Malik, Murabbi, Mun'im, Qayyim. It's got several meanings. The owner, the giver of gifts, the caretaker. It's that part of our life that basically all of us share. And then Allah Azza wa says, above and beyond that, He's also the one who created you. Now, in order to think about who created me, I have to think far beyond my own memory. Right? I don't remember, like Allah says, مَا أَشْهَدْتُهُمْ خَلْقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَا خَلْقَ أَنفُسِهِمْ I didn't make them witness the creation of the skies and the earth, and I did not make them cre- witness their own creation. We weren't around, or we weren't, you don't remember when you were created. We, we don't even remember when we were around, 
as, as uh, you know, children of our mothers. But the furthest, even the one who doesn't believe in the unseen, the furthest back they can think about their creation is their own mother. Right? That my mother is from where I was created. Right? And so as a result, human beings naturally have a loyalty to their parents. And by extension, that loyalty becomes loyalty to their culture, their society. Because those parents have parents, they have extended family, and that extended family belongs within a culture. So people have affiliation of language, culture, values, you know, these things, and, and maybe sometimes nation, tribe. These affiliations are an extension of the fact that you came from your mother. Your mother determined all of that, actually. From everything from your language, to your, affiliate, your tribal affiliation, your racial affiliation, your cultural affiliations, a lot of that is actually determined by what in the worldly sense is your creator, is your mom, in the worldly sense. Allah Azza wa takes us a further step back, farther beyond our imagination can go. He's the one who created you. In other words, He's challenging our loyalties. Because you know, between a master and a slave, that relationship cannot exist unless there is what? Loyalty. And if you don't have loyalty, the only time a master will obey, or rather a slave will obey, is when the master is there. And when the master is not to be found, what's the slave going to do? Do his own thing. Right? Allah Azza wa started this surah by saying, يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ They believe in the unseen. And that master, Allah Azza wa is al-batin. He's actually hidden from our eyes. We don't see him. So when you don't see him long enough, you start thinking maybe you're free, and you're free to do whatever you want. And then your true loyalties show up. Right? Like, much like the example of children that are forced to pray. Right? If your parents are there telling you Maghrib, 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 they're going to pray. When the, children, when the parents are like, okay, I got to go, make sure you pray Maghrib. It's off duty, man. I don't got to pray nothing. You know? And then a lot of kids, they pray, but they don't make wudu. And of course, the standard answer, of course, I, yeah, I pray. Yeah, I made wudu. Like last year, I, I have it. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's a question of loyalty. Now, if you go, as, as people grow, their, mature, their loyalty is extended not just to their, you know, their, their parents, but to their parents' parents and their ancestry and thus an entire tradition, right? And so a lot of reasons. Why did people disobey Allah? Why did people reject prophets? A lot of people, why didn't they accept Islam? What are my parents going to think? What is my culture going to think? What is my society going to think? Well, all this tradition that I've been following and my family has been following, for hundreds of years, we've been a proud member of this religion or this society. Uh, my parents were scholars and you know, preachers of this faith and that faith. How can I just walk away from that faith? I can't just do that. In other words, you think not just about yourself, you think about those who came before you and your loyalty to them. What does Allah do in this ayah? If you're going to be my slaves, you're going to have to rethink all of those loyalties. الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ he, The one who created you, and he's also the creator of those who came much before you. Now your this mastery is something that goes back lineages and your true loyalty if you're thinking that this is a betrayal to your ancestry actually your ancestry was just as responsible to Allah directly as you are now. So it's a profound sequence that is mentioned in these ayat. The next thing I want to share with you is just a, a, a one a leftover comment from the meanings of the word surah. To be suratin I told you lots of meanings of the word surah, but at least one basic idea from which we built all of the other images, I think everybody here remembers, it's the outside wall of a city. You remember that? Those walls were only built when you wanted to protect some kind of high value institutions, right? The treasury of the nation, the castle, something. Every surah actually protects timeless guidance, advice, counsel, teachings, beliefs. The Tawheed in Allah, the Risala of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the, 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 pro, the prohibitions, the commandments, things you shouldn't do, things you should do. These are priceless teachings. And you know what happened in previous revelations? Allah also gave halal and haram to Banu Israel. Allah also told right and wrong to the people of Salih. Allah also taught these things to Ibrahim Alaihi Salam and He taught them to His nation. But over time, there was nothing protecting those teachings. So those teachings got corrupted over time and they were lost. But this time, instead of just revealing ayat, and just revealing, you know, revelation and, and wahi, Allah Azza wa decides He's going to reveal a surah. He's going to reveal something that's going to remain protected. So this, the miraculous perfection of the Qur'an has a purpose. The purpose of it is that generation after generation after generation, the teachings will remain as pure 
as they were with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That has never happened in human history. Just a couple of generations later, those same pure teachings start getting corrupted to the point where they're almost entirely lost. As a matter of fact, the Israelites are probably the, the best case study, in a sense also the worst case study, because they would get a, uh, I told you before, they, they would get a prophet every what? Every generation, and they would still change the book. Like how much time did you have to change it? A prophet came and fixed it just for you. And they'd still make edits. And then a prophet would come and fix it again. And they'd still make edits. And he would come and fix it again. To the point where by the time Isa alayhi salam comes, much of whatever's recorded of Jesus' sayings and his sermons and his preaching in, in different parts of Israel, right, in Jerusalem and, and Nazareth and all of these teachings, you'll find a lot of it is actually very angry speeches against rabbis who changed the word of God, who changed their fatawa and things. He's like going after the alim class of their, the mufti class of that time. He's just going after them. He became public enemy number one to them before anybody else. And you, you don't find him much much condemnation of the Roman Empire as much as you do of the corruption within the Ummah of Banu Israel on the tongue of, of uh, Isa alayhi salam. Now, the challenge was produce some surah, some surah anywhere close to it, min mithlihi. This is actually the sixth time in the Qur'an that this challenge is issued. This challenge has been issued before this five times. But the interesting thing is, all five of those times are actually when the Prophet was still in Mecca sallallahu alayhi wa This is the only time this challenge is issued when the Prophet is in Medina. And this is early Medina. This is actually, this part of Baqarah is very early. And it's not later on, it's been a few years in Medina, no, no, no. This is actually, a lot of it is even before the first battle of Islam, before Badr. Actually the ayat that prepare the Muslims for Badr are in Baqarah. So they, they even belong in Baqarah, okay? Now some of those ayat from before, أَمْ يَقُولُونَ تَقَوَّلَهُ بَلَّا يُقِنُونَ You know, they, they say, بَلَّا يُقِنُونَ they, they, Do they say that he's made it up himself? It's artificial speech that he tries to make? No, the truth is they just don't want to believe. And he says, فَلْيَأْتُوا بِحَدِيثٍ مِثْلِهِ Then why don't they bring, let, let them bring a speech like it. Not anywhere close to it, not مِمْ مِثْلِهِ But حَدِيثٍ مِثْلِهِ إِنْ كَانُوا صَادِقِينَ Bring some speech like it, something new like it. Hadith, by the way, comes from hadith, which is something new, you know. So bring some new style of speech like it, if in fact you're truthful. And here I want to share with you on a, on a side note, something remarkable. And I'm really grateful to this scholar. Those of you that are interested in the subject, look up his name, Basim, Basim Sa'ih. He's written both in Arabic and in English on the miracle of the Qur'an. He's a linguist. Um, I don't know where he is currently. I'm trying to find him so I can call him and thank him for his work. But one of, the thing, one of the areas of research that he did is actually he collected the entire corpus of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. All the hadith there are. Sahih, hadith, sahih, da'if, hasan, anything. Just whatever is attributed, you know, authentic or not, let's just collect all of it in one place. And then he did a linguistic analysis of this entire body. You know, because when a person speaks, like when I speak, there are certain patterns. I'll say things like, so cool, a lot. That comes out of my mouth a lot. If you watch a lot of my videos, it's probably a thousand times. It's so cool. You know, it's a pattern in my speech. Rasulullah also has a pattern in his speech. And that pattern becomes evident when you study thousands upon thousands upon thousands of what? A hadith. You know, and a, a, a pattern emerges, a speech style emerges. So he does a study of the style of the speech of the Prophet, and he compares it to the style of the speech of the Quran. He does purely a linguistic analysis, a Western academic linguistic analysis. This has nothing to do with religion or Islam or spirituality, it's just pure linguistics. And he discovers some remarkable things. The Qur'an uses combinations of nouns and verbs, prepositional phrases, it uses expressions that were never ever used by the Prophet ﷺ, ever. And actually many of them that were never even used by Arabs ever. Just in Fatiha alone, in the Fatiha, that we recite all the time, he found 58 examples of combinations that were never ever used by the Arabs. Hadith, something new. Something that's never, it still makes sense, and yet it's never been used. For example, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ We recite that in Fatiha, yes? What are the two words that come together? غَيْرِ وَلَا in Arabic, for whatever's been recorded of the Arabic language, and the entire corpus of Hadith, you'll find لا ولا Neither this nor this. Laysa wala. Ma wala. Ghaira wa ghaira. Ghaira aw. You don't find ghair and la together ever. Ever. The only time that happens is in Fatiha. In, in the Quran. Subhanallah. And yet it makes sense completely to the Arabs and they're like, this makes sense, but nobody ever talks like this. 
And then one, of the, one more example of that is mind-boggling, guys. It's absolutely fascinating. It's the use of the word kana. Kana in Arabic has always meant was. Kana means was. Quran comes along and uses it in the meaning of is also. Never been done. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رحيما. Allah is, has always been and is forgiving, extremely forgiving, loving and merciful. So kana had what original meaning? Was. And Quran over 190 times used it in what meaning also? Is. Right? This is unique to the Quran. Arabs never did it before. What about the Prophet himself sallallahu alayhi wa Thousands upon thousands of hadith. How many times he used the word kana? Not once did he use it to mean is. Not once did the Prophet ﷺ borrow anything from the Qur'an in his own speech. Even something as basic as what? Kana. He never used it in the meaning of is. In other words, like, it's clear what they say in academic language, distinction of authorship. This is clearly not the same author. They're not willing to go any further and say kalamullah, right? But subhanallah, this is actually, that's, why you mean, that's what I mean by hadith. The speech pattern, the way in which the Qur'an speaks was unprecedented. Absolutely never done before. Not even replicated. Borrow a few phrases here and there that the Prophet ﷺ used to actually quote the ayat within a hadith sometimes. Other than that, his own speech and even the, the vocabulary within the prophetic sayings وسلم, is so different from the Qur'an. It's so like, visibly different from the Qur'an. It's remarkable. So now, that's فَلْيَأْتُ بِحَدِيثِ مِثْلِهِ إِنْ كَانُوا صَادِقِينَ Then Allah Azza wa Jal takes that challenge a step further. And these, by the way, these two challenges that I'm about to mention, they're about the entire Qur'an. Hadith meaning the entire Qur'an. He says, قُلْ لَا إِنْ اجْتَمَعَتِ الْإِنْسُ وَالْجِنُّ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لَا يَأْتُونَ بِمِثْلِهِ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ ظَهِيرًا Tell them if human beings, all human beings, and all jinn were to get together on a collective group project, you know, and they were, unite, they were to unite together. عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ on the, perp, on, on, the, on the task of producing something like this Qur'an. The likes of this Qur'an. لَا يَأْتُونَ بِمِثْلِهِ They're not going to be bringing anything of its like. وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ ظَهِيرًا Even if they were to back each other up. So even, even, if, even if you were to scour the minds of humanity, and even call upon the jinns that have access to the skies, you won't be able to come up anywhere near this Qur'an. But that challenge again was about the Qur'an in its entirety. Then Allah Azza wa Jal takes the next step. أَمْ يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَاهُ Do they say that he's made it up? فَأْتُوا بِعَشَرِ سُورٍ مِثْلِهِ مُفْتَرَيَاتِ Then go ahead, bring ten surahs like it, made up. And that's sarcasm in the Qur'an. It's so easy to make it up, right? Why don't you make ten of them? Go ahead, make ten surahs. I mean, because you've already said, لَوْ شِئْنَا لَقُلْنَا مِثْلَ هَذَا If we want, had we wanted, we could have said something like it. Ah, I could have done that. You know, like somebody who's watching sports, and they're watching like LeBron James do a nasty dunk, and they're like, I could do that. You're like four foot three. What, what, you could do that on your, your baby's dunk hoop that you bought from play school at Toys R Us, but you can't, you can't do that, you know. They heard the Qur'an and said, oh, you know what, I, I just don't want to, but if I did, I would have done it, you know. لَوْ شِئْنَا لَقُلْنَا مِثْلَ هَذَا Allah says, why don't you, oh, it's so easy, why don't you, not one, why don't you make ten of them? Made up also, مُفْتَرَيَاتٍ وَدْعُوا مَنِ اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ And why don't you do this? Why don't you make up these ten surahs and then find whoever you can, whoever you're capable from, other than Allah, in كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ If in fact you're truthful, go get help from whoever you can. Then this challenge gets even tougher. أَمْ يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَاهُ فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِثْلِهِ Do they say that he's made it up? And then Allah says in Surah Yunus, He says, then why don't you bring a single surah like it? Just bring one. And by this time, the shortest surahs have already come down, like, إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَاكَ الْقَوْثِ They'll bring up three lines. وَلَا عَصْرِ إِنَّا الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خَوْسِ Not much, it's not, even, it's not even a third of a page. You could produce something like that, can't you? Just go ahead. And وَدْعُوا مَنْ اِسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ Call whoever you want, whoever you're capable of, other than Allah. In fact, if in fact you're telling the truth, if you really can, go ahead. And this challenge, you know, there it's, it's, it's so impossible to meet this challenge for so many reasons. Linguistics is just one of them. No the Qur'an is talking about history that the Arabs had never even heard of. Western academics that try to prove that the Qur'an is made up. They say the Prophet borrowed stories from the Bible. 
Then he borrowed stories from Greek history. Then he borrowed stories from Abyssinia. Then he borrowed stories from here. Then there, then there, then there. And by the time they're done telling you how many places he borrowed from, you're like, how much did the Prophet travel? And how many universities did he get a degree from that he found these like hidden archives of obscure texts that have these parallels to the Qur'an that he went and dug into their books and said, ah, I'll borrow this part over here and that part over there and that part over there. The fact that you're finding parallels in the Qur'an to so many variations of worldwide literature in itself is an indication that this is from Allah. <laughs> in and of itself, like this can't be from a man in the desert sallallahu alayhi wasallam who has access to the best of the knowledge of the time. The best of the knowledge of the time. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi was in Mecca. For example, when Surah Yusuf was revealed. The 12th surah of the Quran, Surah Yusuf, he's still where? In Mecca. He's not in, he's not in contact with the Jewish community at all. The Jewish community is where? The, a faction of them in Medina. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi is given the entire Surah Yusuf. And Surah Yusuf has such elaborate detail of the life of Yusuf, who is an important figure in Jewish tradition. That's in Jewish tradition. And the Qur'an comes and corrects a lot of the, the contradictions and the errors that were introduced into the biblical version of the story of, Jew, of, of Yusuf salam, And he corrects them in the, in, in the Qur'an. Subhanallah. And that's not even when the Jews were around. And the Arabs are listening to Yusuf and they're like, who's this Yusuf guy? We never heard of him. So much of the Qur'an talking about Musa salam, while the Prophet is in no contact with Jews. In, in, in Surah Taha is Makki. Surah Al-Qasas is Makki. You would think all the ayat, all the references to the Jewish tradition should only come up when the Prophet is where? In Medina and he's dealing with them. But no. Subhanallah. So by the time the Prophet ﷺ comes to Medina, he's already challenging them with what they have. I was sitting with a rabbi not too long ago. It's a couple of years now. And I was telling him, so tell me about Moses. Tell me the story as you know it. Because four out of the five books of the, Hebrew, of the Hebrew Bible are dedicated to the life of Musa. It's a huge seerah with them. Like the amount they have on Musa is tr tremendous. So how does revelation begin for him? Well, he was traveling and he saw a fire. I was like, was he alone? No, he was with a sheep. I was like, no, he wasn't with a sheep. He was with his family. What are you talking about? You know? Then I realized, why did they put sheep there? Why didn't they put his family there? Because his family was from Madian. He married where? In Madian. And Madian is Arab. And his family is Arab. And his children are? Of, of an Arab mother, and to the Arab, to the Jews, uh, ethnicity comes from the mother. <laughs> so if they accept this, then the children of Musa are what? Oh, okay. of Arab, that, that's a problem, so he was with a sheep. <laughs> let's just, that's way better, you know, and then he went and he got revelation. SubhanAllah, you know, how convenient. Quran came and exposes how they tried to cut out this, you know, because they don't want anything to do with the Arabs. He wanted to cut that relation, sever that tie in any way possible. But he went to Madian, you know, and he, he marries, yeah, Madian is Arab land. As a matter of fact, even the eight years that, you know how it was, you, you should work for me eight years, and if you want, you could do ten years. What is the Arabic in the Quran used for that? Thamaniyata hijaj. Thamaniyata hijaj. Not thamani sanawat. Not thamaniyata awam. Eight years. He says hijaj. Hijaj comes from what Arabic word everybody here should know? Guess. Hajj. Where is hajj done? The man who speaks to him, his father-in-law, says, look, eight hajj seasons and you can go. Even made reference to the Kaaba to Musa alayhi salam. Even made Kaaba, reference to the Kaaba. Musa alayhi salam knew the Kaaba. He himself knew. Subhanallah. How would, he, how would he not know in reference to hajj is being made? There is no such thing as hajj to Jerusalem. Never been. Hajj has only been an institution for where? For the Kaaba built by Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Musa alayhi salam was introduced to it within his own family by his father-in-law. This is the tr this is how the Quran exposed history. I mean, the Arabs of the, the, of Mecca were like, we're, "What is this stuff? We don't know any of this stuff." Not you know, there's this content here that is way beyond our education, and then there's the style that is way beyond our capability. So from content and from style, we're just completely stumped. But now the Prophet moves to Medina, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now we get to this ayah. When the Prophet ﷺ moves to Medina, he's not dealing with Arabs that aren't very well educated, very, very few of them know how to read and write. Now he's in a society where yes, there are pagans also. Aus and Khazraj had mushrikeen also. But now you have the Jewish people there. 
You have the Christian people there. And these people are people of scholarship and tradition. They're knowledgeable people. And so when Allah says, why don't you produce a surah? It's not like the challenge of Mecca. In Mecca, the challenge may have been, we know how to make poetry, let's try to do something like this. But the challenge in, 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 in now in Medina, is we should just show him a piece of Torah. Or we should just show him something that we have, that can match. You know, the problem is, if they were to bring any piece of Torah, it would actually confirm the Qur'an. So they couldn't do that. They had to keep that confidential. And then Allah challenged them even further. And the first time and the only time in all of these, the five challenges before this, this is the sixth one. And in the sixth one, what does Allah do? Instead of saying, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِثْلِهِ He says, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِمْ مِثْلِهِ Anywhere near it. In other words, to the Jews of Medina, the Prophet ﷺ now says, you guys are the most qualified to meet this challenge, but I will challenge you with the hardest of challenges. Don't even bring me a surah, bring me something even remotely close to a surah like it. Why don't you just do that much? And then he says, min dunillah. Call your witnesses. And witnesses are two things. Witnesses on the one hand are experts that are going to testify, this, this is actually, wow, this is in fact a match. Witnesses are also helpers. Call your aides besides Allah. If in fact you're telling the truth, if in fact you are, aren't convinced. And the in kuntum sadiqeen means two things. Actually means you're not even telling the truth about you being doubtful. Allah is actually calling their bluff. Because it began in kuntum fi raibin. In kuntum fi raibin. He doesn't say kuntum fi raibin. Wa antum fi. No, no, in kuntum. If it's the case that you're in doubt, by the end he says, if in fact you're telling the truth. In other words, Allah is saying, I'm calling you out, you're not telling the truth, you're not in any doubt that this is the word of God. You're just making this up to cover up your corruption and your pride. That's the only reason you're coming up with this criticism. One last note about this ayah is, you know, how it's misused nowadays, and these ayat are misused. You know, back in the day when I was in college, we had the MSA, and we had Discover Islam Week, and you, you put a booth out and you put like pamphlets on the table and you're like, people are coming and you give them a free slice of pizza and you hand them a pamphlet about Islam and some guy comes and hey man, what's this Islam thing? And you're like, uh, well, Islam is one God and we believe in the Prophet and we believe in this book and he goes, I'm not so sure. And you go, yeah, kafir, produce a surah like it. Why don't you make a surah, huh? He's like, what's a surah, man? Is that like a different kind of pizza? What, what do you, what, what's a surah? Like... <laughs> I don't know what a surah is, man. Like, <laughs> this is not the first step in da'wah. The challenge to produce a surah like the Qur'an is not the first step in da'wah. As a matter of fact, it's not even da'wah. It's the last step before the doors of punishment open. I need you to understand this point. Allah Azza wa Jal invited humanity through counsel, through advice through appealing to their inner goodness, to their sense of justice, to their sense of gratitude. The first invitation to humanity is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahimi Maliki Yawmiddin. That's the first invitation to humanity. Most of the Qur'an is calling people to be grateful for the sky Allah put over their heads, the earth under their feet, the, the, the drinks they drink, the food they eat, the spouse they enjoy. That is the way Allah appeals to humanity, to their good nature. Because Allah, Allah created human beings on good nature. فطرت الله التي فطر الناس عليها but you know in previous, let's not think about Qur'an for a second, think about previous nations. In previous nations, when prophets gave good advice and people didn't listen, then to convince the people, to convince the people, Allah would send miracles, yes? And after Allah sent a miracle, there is no excuse left to disbelief. Once He sends a miracle to challenge people, look, if you don't think this is from God, then tell me how, how this happens. Tell me how Naqatullah is working with Salih alayhi salam. Show me what, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the bird turning into, the, the clay bird turning into a living bird. Or the staff turning into a snake. Show me how this can be anything other than from Allah. After the people reject a miracle, not after they reject the da'wah, not after they reject the counsel and the advice and the reminder, after they reject what? The miracle. Then the only thing left is punishment. 
then that's the only thing left. Because now you have proven that the best of what you could have guided you, the best of what could have guided you, is not enough for you. I mean, think about Fir'aun. Where did he follow Musa alayhi salam into? The, wa- the, the river, the, wa- the, the open water. I mean, he's seeing two mountains of water on either side. Shouldn't that be enough to put the brakes on and say, hold on, maybe he's onto something. If that's not enough for you, then you deserve to be destroyed. You understand? That is why in this ayah, when Allah Azza wa Jalla says, produce a surah like it, in other words, deny and prove that this is not a miracle. And if you're willing to go that far, then فَاتَّقُوا nar. That's going to come in the next ayah. Then be ready for fire. In other words, this is not da'wah. This is like the ultimate act of defiance for the, the people who say they don't, they don't care anything for the power of the Qur'an. We're not out to prove the miracle of the Qur'an as the first step. We're not. That is not the way that da'wah was ever done by any prophet. That was actually a last resort. Okay? The, the, the da'wah of the Qur'an and of this deen remains appealing to human senses, human reason, human goodness, the nature, the nature that Allah put inside of every human being. So that's fa'tu bi suratin min mithlihi. وَادْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُم مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ فَإِنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا Oh, I love this ayah. فَإِنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا Then, if the fact of the matter is that you haven't done so. I love the word if here, in. Kalam shartiya. Kalam sharti. What does it mean? Look, it's been several years since the Qur'an came down. And Allah is actually calling out the Jewish community because, the, especially the rabbis, because you would think the Prophet has only come to Medina a few months, so they've only had contact with the Prophet ﷺ and the Quran for a few months. But the fact of the matter is, they've been secretly conspiring against the Prophet ﷺ, collaborating with the Quraysh, furnishing them difficult questions to ask the Prophet ﷺ after listening to the Quran for years. They've actually been exposed to the Quran for a long time now. And now it's only becoming obvious that they've been exposed to the Quran and still in denial. So Allah says, if you haven't been able to come up with something, why don't you just recheck your records, see if you've come up with something. And they're like, have we come up with something? Let's check. No, actually we haven't. You haven't been able to do anything. Notice here Allah says, لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا And this is it's called سِيرَةُ shartiyah, Conditional statements. And conditional statements could be past tense or present tense. Now this is going to sound technical, but I'll make it simple, I promise. If he came, as opposed to if he comes. If he came, and if he comes. One of them is actually more, bro- it's broader than the other. And I'll tell you which one. If he came is broader than if he comes. Let me tell you why. If I say if he comes, that means he hasn't come yet. Isn't it? He hasn't come yet. But in the English language, just as the Arabic language, if I say if he came, it could mean I'm talking about the past. If he came three hours ago, that's a good thing. It could also mean, if he came now, that'd be nice. In other words, when you use the past tense, it includes the past and it includes the present. When you put an if there, the past tense can communicate past and present. You with me? When Allah says, وَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا As opposed to, وَإِن لَا تَفْعَلُوا If you say, إِن لَا تَفْعَلُوا It is only talking about the present. But if you say, إِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا It incorporates the past. And the present, in other words, the statement is saying, if you haven't been able to do much, all this time and even now. All of that's captured in, illam taf'alu. Then the next thing I love here is taf'alu, as opposed to illam ta'malu. Fi'il in Arabic is to do something. Amal in Arabic is also to do something. But amal is done muta'amidan, consciously, with an effort. When you do something, that's called amal. That's why we read, amilu salihat. They do good things with the right intention, consciously. We don't do fa'alu salihat, like they accidentally did good deeds. Fi'l is like, breathing is a fi'l. You don't think about it like, wait, hold on, let me exhale. You don't do that. You don't think about it, it just happens. That's a fi'l. But when you're writing, that's a what? That's a amal. But when a kid is in class, bored to death, and he's drawing whatever he wants, and he's not even thinking about what he's doing, that's actually a fi'l. <laughs> he's not using his brain. You understand the difference between the two? Allah Azza wa says in this ayah, you can't even accidentally stumble upon genius. What to do it on purpose? فَإِلَّمْ تَفْعَلُوا <laughs> Not even تَعْمَلُوا تَفْعَلُوا You can't even... And, and the, the next part of this is, فِعِل is actually the most generic word for doing anything. 
The verb in the previous ayah was bi suratin. Bring forward a surah. So if you kept the same verb, it would have been fa'illam ta'tu bihi. Walan ta'tu bihi. That would have been consistent with the previous ayah, but Allah chose to change it. He says, wa illam taf'alu. Why? Because Allah is saying, forget bringing a surah. You can't even do the first step that would go in that direction. You can't do anything. You can't even take the first step. You ever heard of something called writer's block? <laughs> right? You're about to write something. You're like, I don't know where to begin. Okay, I'm going to go play some video games, clear my mind. I don't know where to begin. I think I'm going to take a nap. It'll help me think, you know. Especially when guys have homework. I don't know if girls have that problem. When guys have homework, we get writer's block, and we can help that writer's block with a PlayStation, or with sleep, or with a walk, or with more sleep, or with food. You know, uh, you know cheese doodles help. And then you, you write down one sentence, and you go, ah, writer's block again. <laughs> Allah Azza wa Jal here is saying, if you haven't even begun, you can't even begin to take any action towards that direction. Illam taf'adu. The other, the next beauty of this, this speech is that حذف المفعول به لم يقول إلا لم تفعلوه ولن تفعلوه There's no, if you, in English you translate, if you haven't been able to do it or do so, there's no it in the Arabic. And you know why that is? Because they can't do anything. They can't do any of it. And if the, the beauty of it, like Dr. Samirai mentioned, so beautiful, he says, if Allah mentioned any maf'ul here, if, he, if, you're, if you're not able to do it, or do the speech, or do the style, then it would have been one of many things. Like the Qur'an, maybe somebody says, I think I came close to its style, but they still wouldn't have been close to its substance. Or I think I came close to its subject matter, but they still wouldn't have come close to its accuracy with history. They could have come close to maybe one dimension, but the Qur'an has so many infinite dimensions from which it is unmatchable that it cannot be contained in a word. So Allah Azza wa just says, فَإِلَّمْ تَفْحَدُوا There's a maf'ul bihi isn't even possible. An object of this verb isn't even possible. If you can't do. You know, there's no, there's no, nothing in front and that in simple English means if you can't, if you haven't been able to do anything at all. And by the way, so bad that you weren't able to do it all this time. Better luck in the future? No. Walan tafalu, And you will not ever be able to do. You won't be doing anything at all. After such a stern pro, you know, such a stern challenge, you would think some people would have come up and said, you know what, let's do it. He says, we can't do it, we're going to do it. And they could have just come up with some bogus lines. And then they could have had some fake friends come and say, yeah, yeah, it's just like Quran. Because all Allah asked for was, وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ Right? Call your witnesses. Previously he said, وَدْعُوا مَنْ إِسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ Whoever you can. But this time the challenge is even harder. Even easier for, for the challenger. Find any witness. Bring anybody. Any witness. Just bring them and let them judge, testify. The Arabs of Mecca and of Medina were so overpowered by these words that they couldn't even dare to issue that challenge, even if it's just words. Think about this. See, it doesn't make you think. The Quraysh, most powerful tribe in the land, most eloquent of the poets, most resourceful in, in, in their, in their, their money-wise, education-wise, trade-wise, most resourceful people. And the Prophet ﷺ is not threatening them with weapons. He's not threatening them with outside armies. He's not threatening them. What is, he, what is the Prophet ﷺ bringing to them that is so dangerous? Words. Words. And the easiest thing to do with words is to kill them with what? With words. These people of Quraysh were ready to spill blood, kill, fight their own family, expel, engage in multiple wars, but they just couldn't come up with words. I mean the options were if you just came up with something like the Qur'an, this conflict is over. You don't have to kill anybody or fight anybody. or This expensive venture is done. Allah Azza wa Jal defeated them with His words. These words were heavier to them. These were, these were more difficult. And getting on the battlefield against your own son and against your own father was easier for them. Subhanallah. That's the power of the kalam of Allah. 
وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا فَاتَّقُوا النَّارِ Then fine, if you want to challenge the miracle of Allah, then you, what will be done with you is what was done with all the nations before you who challenged the miracle of God. Then go ahead and try and protect yourselves from the fire. Whose fuel, وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ Whose fuel is people and stones. People meaning people of all ages that have challenged the miracles of Allah. And stones, some say the stones that they worshipped. Others say stones are mentioned just because their hearts were turned into stone, later on it will come. So it's only appropriate that they be burned with the stones that their hearts had become. Others have said that when you burn stone, it's like lava, right? It's the hottest kind of heat there can be. It's, like, it's much hotter than burning like, you know, uh, uh, like wood or something. So it's the most intense kind of flame. That's the fuel of the hellfire. وَعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ It has been prepared for those who deny. Those who deny what? Those who deny the miracle of, the, of Allah after they're exposed to it. There's one thing to challenge it and say, I'm not convinced. It's another that you know you can't challenge it. You've already been defeated. In your heart of hearts, you already know it's not the truth. Then you know what? Then the hellfire is for you. Now in these few minutes that I have left, I want to get to the good side. Finally, we've talked about hypocrites, we've talked about kuffar, we've talked about people who challenge the Qur'an. Things are, I mean, it's been a dark mood for a long time. And now Allah Azza wa brings light to the occasion. He tells His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا You personally, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, congratulate those who've believed. Beautiful words. You remember Allah was speaking before. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ الْكَلَامْ كَانَ مِنَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فَالْآنْ أَمَرَ نَبِيَّهُ بِأَنْ يُخَاطِبَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He commanded his Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet is now talking to us by the command of Allah. You congratulate those who've believed. In this ayah, there's a remarkable, remarkable teaching. The Ummah of Islam, the Ummah of Muhammad ﷺ. The first thing we should do with the Ummah when we preach the message of Islam is actually tabshir. بَشِّرْ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا it's not Bashir al Amanu wa Anzir al Amanu. It's not like that. Yes, the Quran has good news and it has warning, yes? But when it comes to us reaching the Ummah and talking, if you have five minutes to talk to somebody, you know, you have no other chance to meet with them, and you say, they said maybe you can say a few things about Allah. You remind somebody, you went to some party, they pray, they, you know, they're, they're hanging out, talking about all kinds of things, and you can tell these are people that don't really go to any religious circles. And then they, they accidentally prayed Maghrib with you, and you led the prayer. And you have a chance, you're sitting there, everybody's like awkward, like is he going to say something? Or, or what? You have these couple of minutes, those couple of minutes are not there to remind them of hell. Those couple of minutes are there to give them some hope. Give them good news. You know, there's a, there's a time when people are maturing, and they're, they're engrossed in crimes or whatever, and they haven't been listening to the good news, then comes the stage of what? Warnings. When you have a Muslim ummah that barely gets any education of Islam, the majority of Muslims aren't learning anything about Islam. And they barely come to the masjid. I mean the fact that they even show up to Jumu'ah is a miracle of Allah. And the one time they do come to Jumu'ah, they get hammered. And then there are people, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. They don't come to Salah, they don't come to even Jumu'ah. The only time you see them in the masjid is Eid. And the Imam is so angry. Where were you people all year? You know Eid is not even a fard prayer. You should be ashamed. This is not the time, bro. They won't even show for Eid prayer next time. <laughs> what are you doing? This is the time to give what? Hope. Because those people that come, you know, a lot of them come with a guilty conscience. I never pray and now here I am. I'm probably, and you ha this is the time to give them a little hope and softness that Allah, ha Allah has not given up on you. You may have given up on Allah for a long time, but Allah hasn't given up on you. That you can go back to Allah. That there's a door open. That Jannah is for any of those who believe. Because a lot of the Muslims who go far away from deen, you know what happens to them? They start believing that they're meant for hell anyway. So many Muslims have come to me and said, Brother, I, I, I know I'm a bad Muslim, I'm not a good person, but I have a question. And I'm like, uh, how do I know you're a good person or a bad person? Why do you think like, the, like that about yourself? Don't, you have better opinion of yourself because Allah has better opinion of you. Don't give up on yourself because Allah hasn't given up on you. How do you know Allah hasn't given up on you? You're still breathing. <laughs> the fact that you're still alive means Allah hasn't given up on you. If you're a lost cause and there's no, no, good of no good to come from you, then there's no reason for you to exist anymore. You understand? So this is, this is a sunnah of a Prophet ﷺ. The first commandment given directly to Rasulullah in the Mus'haf is Bashir. Congratulate. 
It sets the tone for the believer and how they're supposed to carry da'wah. بَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Congratulate those who've believed. And do the few good deeds asked of them. الصالي... By the way, amilu conscious act, yeah? not fa'alu. And الصَّالِحَاتِ is actually الْأَعْمَالَ الصَّالِحَاتِ That's actually how it's understood. Good deeds. But you know, this at at the end, what's called jama' mu'annath salim. This is the feminine plural. Is an indication in Arabic rhetoric of what is called jam'u qilla, meaning a little bit of a plural. In other words, in simple English, congratulate those who believe and do the few good deeds asked of them. Allah did not make an endless list of good deeds. He's asking you for a few basics. Wasn't it the case that people came to Rasulullah and said, tell me something I can do and I can go into Jannah. Did the Prophet say, okay, well, sit down. Let me give you the 800 things you must do to purify your heart. And go through this manual of Tazkiyah and this manual and then you shall have a... He just said, La taghdab. You, just don't get mad. You, just be good to your mom. You, just say, La ilaha illallah thumma staqim. Say, La ilaha illallah, just be firm. Hold on to your faith. Did he even give the same advice to everyone? No. He actually psychologically and spiritually diagnosed people and gave them the one thing that if they worked on, they would become better people. He didn't overburden people with deed upon deed upon deed upon deed upon deed. You understand? When you're, when you're talking to people that are seasoned students, you know there are people who come to the masjid for fajr, and their, their, their ibadah is great, and they do extra fasts and all of these things. Those people want to push themselves higher and higher and higher. Do more and more and more and more. But then there are people who are barely holding on to anything of Islam. Those people don't need a long list. They just need, give me, give me one good thing I can do. Give me one. And Rasul never turned anybody back and said, why are you asking for one good thing? You should be asking for at least five. What do you mean one good thing? Did Rasul Sallallahu ever do that to anybody? But when people come to us and say, brother, can you tell me something good I can do? Well, you, <laughs> let, me, let me make a list for you. <laughs> You have an email address, it'll be a few megabytes of an attachment. <laughs> and PDF form, single line space, font size 6. You know? <laughs> what, this is what you need to do. And maybe one foot out of hell for you. <laughs> you know? SubhanAllah. وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ What do they get? أَنَّ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتٍ That they're going to have not one, multiple gardens. They're going to have multiple gardens. One garden is enough. He says multiple. And when Allah says multiple, we will, we will see that every fruit of Jannah is never the same. If Allah gave you a grape and you tasted it, oh, the next grape, completely different. Oh, every fruit is entirely different every time you have it. Then if every fruit is entirely different, can you imagine the gardens? Because a fruit is the smallest part of what? A garden. Allah gives not one, but multiple gardens. Each garden with its own design, with its own flowers, with its own valleys, with its own waterfalls, with its own wonders. And you've been to one, you're like, ah, it's kind of the same. You know, if you go to like, uh, if you go to a beach in California, then you go to a beach in like Malaysia, and you go to a beach in Hawaii, at the end of the day, 80% of it is in common. It's a beach. Water, sun, sand. There's a few extra rocks here and there. There's a breeze that's kind of similar. Maybe the water is clear. But you know, pretty much it's the same thing. Pretty much. When you're in the middle of the forest, whether you're in the redwood forest or you're in some other, like when you're there, you're like, wow, trees, sky, mountain. It's pretty beautiful. It's all, it reminds me of this other place. Isn't that what you do? It reminds me of this other place. But Allah Azza wa Jal gives gardens and each one of them, مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِيعَتْ وَمَا خَطَرَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِ بَشَرْ No eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard. When you walk in the woods, when you walk in the garden, you hear the birds chirp. You know, you hear the breeze. But the breeze of Jannah, you've never heard. The chirping of those birds, you've never heard. And those birds, we're going to eat those birds too. وَلَحْمِ طَيْرٍ مِمَّا يَشْتَهُونَ There's going to be some good bird in, in Jannah, you know, of what they desire. That's the part I'm looking forward to actually, the birds of Jannah. Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned it, the flesh of bird of what they passionately desire. And I certainly do. The, <laughs> the roasted, whatever that is, heavenly chicken, I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Allahumma adkhilna fil jannah. You know, he says, Tajri min tahtiha al anhar. Underneath all of them, there are rivers flowing. What, me, what that means is, first of all, there's rivers underneath 
meaning underground water, the, under every river. And others have interpreted to mean that these mountains, these, these heavens, these gardens are all on cliffs. And you're all the way on top of the cliff enjoying this garden. And actually, when you go to the edge, it's a waterfall, too. So you're actually on top of a waterfall. You know, and rivers are flowing from underneath you. Others have said perhaps it's like the castles of, you know, Castle Sulaiman alayhi salam, where the floor is water itself. You're walking on water. You know, and you look underneath you and it's just water. You know? So, min tahtiha al anha. Kullama ruziku minha min thamaratin rizqa. Every time they're provided from it of any fruit as provision. Now, ruziku suggests you don't even have to get up and get a fruit. You could, you know, the wata afnan, the trees of Jannah are huge. And you're like, oh, all this fruit up there, how do I, can we order a stick or something? No, no, no. You just chill, you relax, it is brought to you. It is brought to you. You're just sitting there, and you know, يَطُوفُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلْدَانٌ مُخَلَّدُونَ These young butlers, valet boys, that Allah created just as service, service gentlemen for Jannah, you know, they run around, would you like some more apples, sir? And you know, you just, and you have it, of any one of the, min thamaratin, of any fruit, rizqan. You know, in this world, you like some fruits, you're not so crazy about some fruits. Like me personally, not crazy about durian. You know, in, in Malaysia. If you haven't heard of it, good for you. Because, you know, some people like the taste, but the smell, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. You're like, which animal died? You know, it's even Ill illegal in hotel rooms in Singapore. Like you can't take that fruit there. Because <laughs> once you open it, you know, it's, it's a chemical warfare. So, so you like some fruits, you don't like some fruits. And when sometimes the fruit will be presented to you. Maybe it's one of the fruits you weren't crazy about. Maybe somebody brings to you a coconut, and you're like, I'm not so crazy about coconut. So the first impression you get is, hey, this is what we used to have in dunya. قَالُوا هَذَا الَّذِي رُزِقْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِ This is what we used to be given, we used to be provided way back. Way back in dunya. And maybe it's something you liked, and maybe it's something you didn't like. And you know, you're in Jannah, you're thinking everything's going to be good. You know, sometimes your friends want to make you taste something, and you're like, you know, it's going to be really good. You're like, mm, I don't know if I, I don't want to... And I'm like, come on, try it, try it, try it. It's really good, it's great. Crab is great. Or when I was in Malaysia, they made me eat uh, uh, octopus. A bit of octopus. And I was like, ah. No, no, try it, it tastes like chicken. I was like, uh, uh, okay, maybe octopus. <laughs> I took a picture and said to my kids, this is what I just ate. And I got like 8,000 lines of ew <laughs> back. <laughs> you know? But you know, in Jannah, you're being offered this fruit, and the thought might cross somebody's mind, I don't know, I didn't like this in dunya. Oh, this is like what we used to get back home. Hmm, I thought I would get something else. But Allah adds, وَأُتُوا بِهِ مُتَشَابِهًا They will be brought that fruit, and that is, looking similar to what they had before. In other words, it will be similar, but when they take a bite, the surprise will shock them. Like they, what? Let me have an, and then the next bite is even better? And the next bite is even better. And now here's the thing. Sometimes you're eating something that you love. Especially at iftar, right? You're eating something that you absolutely love. If you're a chocoholic, you've got the entire you know, like bucket ready. And you're chowing it down. The problem is once you have one, two, three, four, five. When you get to the tenth one, even you're like, mm, I think I'm done. And there's a stop. And you don't want to, even your favorite meal, you don't want to taste it anymore at a certain point. Even if you had your favorite meal two, three times, you're like, let's eat something else now. I'm a fanatic about chicken shawarmas. But I can only have so many at a time. And after a while, like, let's get some beef or something. Let's do something else. In, in Jannah, you're eating the same fruit. But it's actually never the same. So you never get tired of eating it. It's so amazing. And then Allah adds, وَلَهُمْ فِيهَا أَزْوَاجٌ مُطَهَرَةٌ Thank God there are only five minutes left, so I don't have to explain this part. You know, <laughs> they're going to have purified, it's translated purified spouses. And of course, sisters have no questions about this ayah uh, at all. They're completely happy with this ayah, and it increases their iman, and it makes them look forward to going to Jannah. Uh, I'll say a few things about this word from a language point of view. The first thing I'll say, I'll, I'll only share with you what I'm convinced of. Uh, Allah Ta'ala A'lamu bis-sawab 
in my own study of the Qur'an, whatever I found the most convincing, I like to share. And I don't consider myself a scholar of the Qur'an, I consider myself very much a student of the Qur'an. And I think I'll, I'll die in that state, being a student of the Qur'an, I urge you to do your own studies. But here are a few things I'd like to share with you. In the Qur'an itself, the word azwaj or zawj is used both for males and for females. The word zawj is used, for example, قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهِ uh, the woman came and complained about her zawj, which is her what? Husband. Okay. Then zawj is also used for the wife. Aslahna lahu zawjahu. We fixed his zawj for him, his wife for him. So the word zawj in Arabic actually means counterpart. It's okay to translate spouse, but I like counterpart better. Actually, a perfectly matched counterpart is called a zawj. The sun and the moon are zawjain. The day and the night are zawjain. Okay. This, these are actually zawjain from Allah Azza wa Jal. Similarly, this world and this life and the next life are also Zawjain. They complete each other. This life is a key to the next one. The next life is dependent on this one. They're, they're, they're related with each other. They're Zawjain. There's actually a Zawjiyah inside of the human being. The body and the, the ruh are Zawjain. They're, they count, counterpart each other. They're, they work together. The male and the female are also Zawjain. And in the majority language of the Arabs of the ancient times, the husband was called Zawj and the wife was also called Zawj. She wasn't called Zawjah. The Tamar Buta was not added even for the wife. That's even true in the Quran. Okay? That was actually considered Lugha Nadira min Ahlin Najd, min Ba'di Ahlin Najd. Some people of Najd actually used to use the word Zawjah. Quran didn't use it. Quran used the word Zawj for both man and for woman. Then the next thing is the, pr the plural pronoun Hum. Hum in Arabic is used, it's Damir Shamilun. It's, it's a comprehensive, inclusive pronoun that includes both men and women. So when Allah says, they will have purified spouses, then actually my first inclination is to believe in, in most of these passages that Allah is saying the men will have purified spouses and so will the women have purified spouses. I'm not talking about ta'addud or number. I'm talking about everybody will have a purified spouse, at the very least. They will have a purified spouse. The number is a separate issue. Because actually most of the time in the Qur'an, when Allah speaks about purified spouses, He doesn't say, He will have many spouses. He says, they will have spouses. So there's a plural on this side and a plural on that side. Like for example, if I say, these people have spouses, which could very well mean each one of you has how many? One. I mean, there are hadith traditions and other traditions that refer to multiple. That's a separate issue. That's a later issue. But the Qur'an at the very least confirms everybody will have a wonderful Spouse, one wonderful spouse at the very least. And that is not denied of men or of women. That's not denied. And the nature of the, the nature of a spousal relationship is the next part. What a man desires in a spousal relationship is different from what a woman desires. What a man wants his spousal relationship to look like for the rest of his life or forever is different than what a woman desires. Actually, in this world, whenever a man and a woman come together, at the end of the day, there are compromises. There's, there's some things you're not going to be happy about, some things you're going to have to learn to live with, right? That's going to have to be the case. And then there are some things your wife will have to tolerate and say, Ya Allah in Jannah, please, not, I had enough here. You know, I'm done with this part, I, I can't do this anymore. Because you, you keep leaving, you know, ladoos in the bathroom, like your clothes, and you, you keep doing whatever, you, whatever it is that you do, that she puts up with, she says eventually, Ya Allah, just uh, anything but that, you know, in Jannah. And that, that may well be the case. But then, and, and inshallah, when the time comes, I'll talk to you more about the idea of azwaj and jannah. And, uh, but here I want to add mutahara, purified. Not pure. Pure is an incorrect translation. This is an ism of rule. Thoroughly purified. Meaning purified to you, not just spiritually and in terms of goodness, but purified exactly to your taste. You know, when people get married, before they get married, the, the girl, the guy is interested in, she's perfect in every way. Man, when I look at her, I wonder, what Allah has left in Jannah, because it's all here in this picture on Facebook. <laughs> you know, like, he's like, yeah. So, but when he gets married, then emails start coming to Ustad Maman, and, you know, like, I thought she was perfect, but astaghfirullah, da 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 you know, then it starts, right? In Jannah, it's not just a picture that's perfect, well photoshopped, you know? It's actually the personality, the company. You know, sometimes the wife tests the husband and says, don't you like hanging out with me? And he bites his tongue and says, yes. <laughs> you know, of course I do. 
I hate going out with my friends. <laughs> I, you know. So the idea of mutahara means she's exactly to your liking and he will be exactly to your liking. I know that sounds impossible in this world. But that's a gift of the akhirah, azwajul mutahara. And by the way, just like the fruit, every time you taste it, what does it feel like? The first time you're eating it. I've never had it before. Actually, that's what the case is with the spouse in Jannah. It never gets old. She's actually the first, her, you're, we're going to be with this woman for eternity. You're going to be with that man for eter ever and ever and ever. That's a long time. It's kind of a scary prospect. For, seriously, forever? <laughs> what does Allah Azza wa Jal do? In, in Surah Rahman, He describes Hurun maqsuratun fil qiyam. Not Hurun yaqsurna. Maqsurat. Yuqsarna. Maqsurat. Meaning they're constantly lowering their eyes. When a woman meets her husband for the first time and he closes the door behind him and she avoids making eye contact because she's shy. Those beautiful moments never come back, except in Jannah, it's every time. Every time with her is the first time. Subhanallah. That's mutahara. She's been pure. There's no old history, no scars that have contaminated the relationship. No memory from, remember yesterday what you said? There's none of that. It's all gone. It's mutahara. And then it's okay to understand whom fiha khalidun. And they're going to be in that forever. One last thing about this ayah, I know I've taken long, but I'll just say one more thing about this ayah that's commonly overlooked. But it's part of the language of the Qur'an. The word azwaj in the Qur'an doesn't just come for spouses. The word azwaj in the Qur'an actually comes for people you hang out with and get along with. وَكُنْتُمْ أَزْوَاجًا ثَلَاثًا وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِنْهُمْ Azwaj in those ayat does not mean spouses. Azwaj in those ayat means company you hang out with that you perfectly click with. You know, there are, there are friends that you get along with and you have a laugh with them like you never have with anybody else. And you haven't hung out with those friends in many, many years and years later you hang out with them and you turn 17 again. And you're like, whoa, man, these guys. There's something else, you know. There's something about those groups. Those groups are actually called what? Azwaj, because you complete each other. In that sense, Allah is not just talking about a happy marriage in Jannah. Allah is actually saying, your hangouts, your chill sessions, your, your parties, your groups, your cliques, when you're going to go out on a trip, when you're going to do stuff in Jannah, you're going to have friends that you just love being around. They're your azwaj. And they've been purified just for you. Because a lot of times, when you have a group of friends get together and hang out and have a good time, then one of them is more offensive than the others, or one person becomes the object of ridicule, or one person hurts the other person's feelings. It's a great hangout, but there's some sour moments here and there, right? But in, in Jannah, Allah has purified the collection of people. He's purified them, subhanAllah. And that is one of the joys of heaven. One of the joys, Allah describes this in other places. They're going to be meeting each other, asking each other questions. Hey man, how's it going? You made it too? Oh wow, I didn't think you'd. Okay, okay, you're into that too. Alright, that's cool. How's it been, man? Remember back in the day? And they're going to just chill together. There's literally parties. Because somebody might read Quran and wonder, if I have the perfect spouse, how am I getting time to hang out with my friends in Jannah? Maybe that's part of the perfection of your spouse. She lets you go. <laughs> With that, inshallah ta'ala, I will conclude. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.